we assembled our fighters and, with formations complete, set a course south of Rabul. A massive cloud front filled the entire sky before us, and the black, boiling squall blocked our course. In our bomber, we had little to fear from the weather, but forty-five single-seat fighter planes clung grimly to our tail, knowing that losing our guiding plane in the storm ahead meant almost certain death. Despite our anxiety to reach the main battle force at Balal, the storm's severity forced a disappointed Admiral Kakuda to return to Rabul. We had searched in vain for twenty minutes for a break in the clouds. Our battle plan called for the planes to arrive at Balale at sunset, so that American reconnaissance planes photographing the area would not see the new force of forty-five fighters. By the time we returned to Vuna Canal one hour later, dusk had settled. We sent the fighter planes in to land first. Forty-three Zeros made their precarious landings in the mud without damage, but two planes sank into the treacherous surface and damaged their propellers and undercarriage. Finally, in the dark, our own bomber landed. I was astonished to see Admiral Yamamoto waiting for our plane. Informed of our radio message that we were returning to base, he remained to see Admiral Kakuda. The initial mass attack against the enemy could not be postponed after the 6th, for our forces had long prepared for the raids and were in the most advantageous position to strike. Our 45 fighter planes were desperately needed to escort the bombers against the expected heavy opposition. While it was imperative that we get to Balal, further flight tonight was impossible. After our plane landed, I proceeded at once along the muddy, darkened road from the field to Admiral Azawa's headquarters to receive new orders. We conferred at length on the attack requirements, and not until many hours later did I leave the Admiral's headquarters with an order that our planes were to leave Balal early in the morning of the 7th. We would fly directly to our rendezvous and participate in the air blows. Even as I returned to the field, I met a car dispatched for me by an anxious and worried Admiral Kakuda. The sudden change in plans involved hasty last-minute briefings of the pilots, for we were to leave from the Vunakanao airfield and join the attack directly. Our flight time would be increased, and the pilots were unfamiliar with the areas over which they would pass. Our pilots were, however, confident that they would completely fulfil Admiral Yamamoto's expectations for the success of the attack. We carried out Raid X as scheduled. Following the completion of Operation A, which Admiral Yamamoto was led to believe had caused great damage to the enemy, the Admiral prepared to make a personal survey of our forward bases. He conferred with the commanders and officers of the various Air Corps, stressing that the future of the war could not permit complacency. The Admiral stated further that many great sea battles were yet to be fought, and that victory or defeat in those same battles, and consequently the outcome of the war, would depend largely upon our conduct in air battles. Every man who attended these special meetings could not help but be impressed by the Admiral's sincerity, nor could our staff officers ignore the consequences of failure so dramatically brought to their attention. At 0600 hours on the morning of April 18th, Admiral Yamamoto left Rabul on a flight to Balale in southern Bougainville to inspect personally our airbase, which lay so close to enemy forces. Almost simultaneously with Yamamoto's departure, I flew from Rabaul with Admiral Kakuda for our return flight to Truk. When we returned to his flagship, the aircraft carrier Hiyo, his staff communications officer, ashen-faced, personally delivered a confidential telegram to Admiral Kakuda. Kakuda was a veteran combat naval air officer, known for his iron self-discipline under any circumstances. I was astonished to see the Admiral's face grow pale as he read the message. He uttered something unintelligible, and for some time afterward could not or would not speak to anyone. The incidents leading up to the attack by American fighter planes against Admiral Yamamoto's plane and the death of Japan's greatest naval leader, are recorded in detail in the diary of Vice Admiral Matome Ugaki, Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet, who was with the Admiral at the time of his death. The following passages in quotation marks are from Ugaki's diary. Admiral Yamamoto wished to fly from Rabul to Buin via Balale to inspect frontline navy forces and to pay a personal call on General Hayakutake, commander of the 17th Army. 
the Admiral planned to return on the 19th to our base at Truk. The flight was planned with Admiral Yamamoto's usual meticulous care. Personally aware of even the smallest difficulties of the Navy and Army forces in the Solomons, particularly those troops under General Hayakutake, which had been hard-pressed by savagely fighting enemy troops and ever-increasing air attacks, Yamamoto hoped by this frontline visit to better his own understanding of future problems. Aware that enemy intelligence would literally go to any lengths to discover his presence in the area, the Admiral discarded his white uniform and for the first time donned the Navy khaki garb. At 0600 hours, Admiral Yamamoto left the Rabul airfield in the lead aircraft, a Type 1 Betty bomber, which carried, in addition to Yamamoto, Commander Ishizaki, his secretary, Surgeon Rear Admiral Takata, and Commander Toibana, his air staff officer. In the second aircraft with me were Paymaster Rear Admiral Kitamura, Commander Imanaka of the communications staff, Commander Muroi, air staff officer, and Lieutenant Uno, our meteorology officer. As soon as I entered the second bomber, both aircraft began their takeoff runs down the field. The lead bomber took to the air first. As our planes passed above the volcano at the bay's end, we slid into formation and took a southeast course. Clouds were intermittent, and with excellent visibility, flying conditions were good. I could see our escort fighters weaving in their protective pattern. Three fighters flew off to our far left, three remained high above and behind us, and three others, making nine in all, cruised to the right. Our bombers flew a tight formation, their wings almost touching, and my plane remained slightly behind and to the left of the lead ship. We flew at approximately 5,000 feet. We could clearly see the Admiral in the pilot's seat of the other bomber and the passengers moving within the airplane. We reached the west side of Bougainville Island, flying at 2,200 feet directly over the jungle. A crew member handed me a note reading, Our time of arrival at Balal is 0745 hours. I remember looking at my wristwatch and noting that the time was exactly 0730. In 15 minutes, we would arrive at our first stop. Without warning, the motors roared and the bomber plunged toward the jungle close behind the lead airplane, levelling off at less than 200 feet. Nobody knew what had happened, and we scanned the sky anxiously for the enemy fighter planes we felt certain were diving to the attack. The crew chief, a flight warrant officer, answered our queries from his position in the narrow aisle. It looks as if we made a mistake, sir. We shouldn't have dived. He certainly was right, for our pilots should never have left our original altitude. Our fighter planes had sighted a group of at least 24 enemy planes approaching from the south. They began to dive toward the bombers to warn them of the approaching enemy planes. Simultaneously, however, our bomber pilots also sighted the enemy force and, without orders, raced for low altitude. Not until we had levelled off did our crewmen take their battle positions. Screaming wind and noise assailed our ears as the men unlimbered the machine guns. Even as we pulled out of the dive and returned to horizontal flight above the jungle, our escort fighters turned into the attacking enemy planes, now identifiable as the big Lockheed P-38 Says. The numerically superior enemy force broke through the zeros and plunged after our two bombers. My own plane swung sharply into a 90-degree turn. I watched the crew chief lean forward and tap the pilot on the shoulder, warning him that the enemy fighters were fast closing in. Our plane separated from the lead bomber. For a few moments I lost sight of Yamamoto's plane and finally located Betty far to the right. I was horrified to see the airplane flying slowly just above the jungle, headed to the south, with bright orange flames rapidly enveloping the wings and fuselage. About four miles away from us, the bomber trailed thick black smoke, dropping lower and lower. Sudden fear for the Admiral's life gripped me. I tried to call Commander Muroi, standing immediately behind me, but could not speak. I grasped him by the shoulder and pulled him to the window, pointing to the Admiral's burning plane. I caught a last glimpse of myself, an eternal farewell to this beloved officer, before our plane again swung sharply over in a steep turn. Tracers flashed by our wings, and the pilot desperately manoeuvred to evade the pursuing fighter plane. 
I waited impatiently for the airplane to return to horizontal position so that I could observe the Admiral's bomber. Although I hoped for the best, I knew only too well what the fate of the airplane would be. As our own plane snapped out of its turn, I scanned the jungle. Yamamoto's plane was no longer in sight. Black smoke boiled from the dense jungle into the air. Even as I stared at the funeral pyre of the crashed bomber, our own plane straightened out from its frantic manoeuvring and at full speed raced toward Moiler Point. Shortly we were over the open sea. We noticed the concentration of dogfighting planes in the area where Admiral Yamamoto's bomber had plunged into the jungle. Other fighters were separating from the group and turning after us now. I stared helplessly as a silver H-shaped P-38 half-rolled in a screaming zoom, then turned steeply and closed rapidly toward our plane. Our gunners were firing desperately at the big enemy fighter, but to little avail. The bomber's 7.7mm machine guns could not reach the approaching P-38. Taking advantage of his superior speed, the enemy pilot closed in rapidly and still beyond the range of our defensive machine guns, opened fire. I watched the P-38's nose seem to burst into a twinkling flame, and suddenly the bomber shook from the impact of the enemy's machine gun bullets and cannon shells. The P-38 pilot was an excellent gunner, for first his fusillade of bullets and shells crashed into the right side of the airplane, then into the left. The drumming sounds vibrated through the airplane, which rocked from the impact of the enemy fire. We knew we were now completely helpless and waited for our end to come. The P-38 hung grimly to our tail, pouring in his deadly fire. One by one, our answering machine guns fell silent. Abruptly, the crew chief, who had been shouting orders to his men, fell from our view. Several of the crew were already dead as the bullets screamed through the airplane. Commander Muroy sprawled over the chair and table in the fuselage compartment, his hands thrown out before him, his head rolling lifelessly back and forth as the plane shuddered. Another cannon shell suddenly tore open the right wing. The chief pilot, directly in front of me, pushed the control column forward. Our only chance of survival was to make a crash landing in the sea. I did not realise it at the time, but a zero pilot above us in a futile attack against the grimly pursuing P-38 reported heavy smoke pouring from our bomber. Almost into the water, the pilot pulled back on the controls to bring the airplane out of its dive, but he could no longer control the aircraft. Enemy bullets had shattered the cables. Desperately, the pilot killed our power, but again it was too late. At full speed, the bomber smashed into the water. The left wing crumpled and Betty rolled sharply over to the left. Prepared for an emergency landing, I do not recall being injured in the crash, Apparently the shock of the planes meeting the water at such high speed numbed my senses, for when I was hurled into the aisle from my seat, my body was bruised and cut. The impact of the crash momentarily stunned me, and everything turned black. I felt the crushing force of salt water pouring into the fuselage, and almost immediately we were below the surface. I was completely helpless. Convinced this was my end, I said a requiem to myself. Naturally, it was difficult to coherently remember everything which happened in those incredible moments, but I vaguely recall that I felt as if life had come to its end. I could not bring myself to move and could only lie perfectly still. I do not believe I was actually knocked unconscious. I did not swallow any seawater. Everything was hazy, and I could not tell how much time passed before. The following day, Search planes discovered the wreckage of the lead bomber in which Admiral Yamamoto had flown to his death. The reconnaissance pilots found no sign of life and reported that fire had entirely consumed the wreckage. On the day of the attack, a native reported to an army road construction crew that a Japanese plane had crashed in the jungle along Bougainville's west coast. Army headquarters dispatched a rescue force which reached the wreckage on April 19th. They picked up the corpses and began their return. It was this same group that our Navy rescue force encountered. The Army group had found Admiral Yamamoto's body, still in his pilot's seat, hurled clear of the airplane. A sword was held tightly in his hand. His body had not yet decomposed, and even in death, dignity did not leave the great naval officer. 
To us, Isoroku Yamamoto virtually was a god. Our doctors later examined his body aboard a submarine chaser and found bullet holes through the lower part of the skull, as well as in the shoulder. Presumably the admiral died instantly aboard the airplane. In addition, only the chief medical officer, his body partially burned, could be identified, as the remainder of the group were burned beyond recognition. As to the wreckage of my own airplane, divers went to 67 feet below the water's surface, but found only the wheels, engines, propellers, machine guns, and one officer's sword. The following day, April 20th, the bodies of two crewmen were washed up on the shore. Of all the personnel aboard both bombers, only Rear Admiral Kitamura, the pilot of my bomber, and I survived. More than 20 men and officers perished. Although death is an everyday occurrence in war, I feel that I am to be blamed for this incident. I was informed at a later date that the enemy, which had in the past made only single-plane reconnaissance missions, had, only one or two days before April 18th, increased his reconnaissance to fighter plane groups. This information from our field forces did not reach Vice Admiral Kusaka's headquarters until 24 hours after the incident. Had we been informed immediately of the sudden appearance of the enemy fighter formations, we could have averted the terrible loss of Admiral Yamamoto. But we were too late. In the same area where so many of his own men had shed their blood for Japan, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto came to the end of his brilliant career. Not only did we suffer an irreplaceable loss in his death, but Japan also lost commanders Toibana and Muroi, considered the two brains of the Navy's air staff. The injured admirals Ugaki and Kitamura and their pilot were rescued by our ships which sped to the scene of the water crash. The itinerary of Admiral Yamamoto and his staff was, of course, a closely guarded secret. Behind the chain of events leading to the successful enemy attack, however, lay the direct cause for the incident. Partially as a courtesy message, the commander of the Shortland seaplane base southwest of Buin had notified his forces in naval code that the Admiral would personally inspect their area. This same message was intercepted and decoded by American Navy headquarters at Pearl Harbor. The Navy immediately informed Army Air Forces headquarters at Henderson Field, Guadalcanal. Late in the afternoon of April 17th, the Henderson Field Message Center delivered to Major John W. Mitchell, P-38 Commander at Guadalcanal, a cablegram from Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy, with the complete information on Admiral Yamamoto's scheduled inspection tour. The message also noted that Yamamoto was most punctilious and could be counted upon to follow his schedule rigidly. Included in the message was a list of the other officers accompanying the Admiral, as well as the fact that the staff would fly in two new type Mitsubishi bombers escorted by six Zero fighters. The only planes capable of performing the interception mission were the Henderson Field P-38S, which had the speed, range and destructive firepower for the attack. The big fighters would have to fly at least 435 miles from Guadalcanal before they could intercept west of Kahili. Contrary to Vice Admiral Ugaki's report of at least 24 enemy planes, Mitchell had available only 18 P-38 fighters. He planned to use six fighters as the attack force against the bombers, which he estimated would fly below 10,000 feet, while the remaining 12 airplanes at 20,000 feet would try to draw off the Zero escort. Interception was planned when Yamamoto's plane was only 35 miles from its destination. Two planes aborted the mission at the start. Mitchell then assigned four of his 16 P-38S to make the attack against the bombers. Lieutenant Thomas G. Lanfear was the pilot who shot down Yamamoto's plane and also shot down a defending Zero fighter in his attack. Lanfear reported that he put a long burst into the right engine, then the right wing, and, still beyond the range of the bomber's defending tail cannon, watched the wing break into flame and tear off the airplane. Caught by two pursuing Zeros, Lanfier went into a steep climb and lost the Zeros. Lieutenant Rex Barber, attacking with Lanfier, raced through three intercepting Zero fighters and shot down the second bomber. Lieutenant Besby F. Holmes shot down two Zeros, making our losses for the day three fighters and two bombers. Our pilots shot down Lieutenant Ray Hines' P-38, and, we verified later, 
Most of the 15 P-38S which returned to Guadalcanal were badly shot up. Some time later, when I, Okumiya, was at Buin during a new attack against the enemy, I visited Admiral Yamamoto's tomb. This was a small, inscribed stone placed over the site where the body was cremated, near the Buen headquarters. Full credit must be given to the fine activities of the American intelligence services, which broke the Japanese code, and kept secret the fact that the Americans were fully acquainted with our naval activities. It was this advanced knowledge which did so much to defeat our fleet at Midway, and which destroyed the Admiral's plane. These unheroic and behind-the-scenes moves not only frustrated the Midway operation and took the life of our most able officer, but contributed directly to our eventual defeat. Ironically, Admiral Yamamoto prophesied his own fate immediately after the Midway conflict. Similarly, our position in the war degenerated specifically as the Admiral had predicted even before December 8, 1941. To me, who had in the past served with this great man, my return to Truk, when we were informed of his death, was a particularly sorrowing moment. From the bridge of the aircraft carrier Hiyo, with grief-stricken Vice Admiral Kakuda, I watched Admiral Yamamoto's flag being lowered from the mast of the world's greatest battleship, the Yamato. I thought to myself at the time, those who so strongly insisted upon war with the United States and England may still be dreaming of success, although victory slips further and further from our grasp. Perhaps, however, we who are carrying the fight to the enemy, as we are ordered to do, may still survive this conflict. It is impossible for me, or any other man, to express in words the mixed emotions which must have been experienced by the Admiral, who so long ago realised the dark future of our country, should we be forced by those in power to launch this war. Despite his apprehensions, as the Commander-in-Chief, Yamamoto was obliged to serve his country to the best of his ability. This he did, but with his command went the feeling of guilt that he had failed in his efforts to convince his government and its ruling hierarchy that war could bring only disaster. Whatever history will decide, the Admiral now can rest peacefully in his grave. At least his death came in a plane of the Naval Air Force, for which he was directly responsible. His unflagging efforts had given his country the most powerful naval air arm in the world, and who can forget the personality of this man, typified by his first action in 1924 as the executive officer of the Kasumigara Air Corps, when he embarrassed the entire corps by insisting that he fly with the poorest pilot of all. The only decisive victory achieved by the Japanese Navy after the disastrous Battle of Midway was scored in the engagement of air-sea forces off Santa Cruz, east of the Guadalcanal area. After Midway and the fleet reorganisation, our surface forces operated with the aircraft carrier as a nucleus. Admiral Yamamoto divided our major naval strength into two units, each with three aircraft carriers. These were the vanguard force of Vice Admiral Nobutake Kondo, commander of the Second Fleet, with three carriers, two battleships, five heavy cruisers, one light cruiser and twelve destroyers and the carrier task force under Vice Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, commander of the Third Fleet, with three carriers, two battleships, four heavy cruisers, one light cruiser and sixteen destroyers. Both fleet units operated in the seas east of the Solomon Islands. Kondo's force coordinated its activities with army groups on Guadalcanal Island, while Nagumo's ships patrolled east of Kondo's fleet to ward off possible enemy carrier attacks. By October 23, 1942, intelligence reported an ominous build-up of enemy carrier strength. Meanwhile, we had suffered our own losses, including the sinking of the aircraft carrier Ryuho, which went to the bottom on August 23 in the Second Solomon's Sea Battle, and the aircraft carrier Hiyo, which limped home with battered engines. Hondo's force was left with only a single carrier, the Junyo, under Rear Admiral Kakuji Kakuda, commander of the 2nd Carrier Division. I, Okumiya, was their air staff officer to Kakuda. After October 16th, we could find no trace of the enemy carriers in the area. They had apparently disappeared. A week later, we encountered a sudden increase in enemy reconnaissance plane activities. The two facts appeared to be linked together. The Americans often withdrew their combat fleet units from an operational theatre, 
taking advantage of the tremendous range of their land-based reconnaissance planes, which kept the warships fully advised of our activities. We sought vainly for some indication of the whereabouts of the enemy ships. On October 24th, we picked up an American radio broadcast, which stated that a major sea and air battle is expected in the near future in the Solomon Islands area. Something was in the wind. October 27th was Navy Day for the enemy, and perhaps the carrier task force commanders would choose this day for a surprise assault. I was familiar with the American love of adventure on such dates and expected the worst to happen. Our military forces were even then committed to the second all-out attack designed to throw the enemy troops off Guadalcanal, and the Americans might take advantage of the situation to force a decisive sea battle at a time when our land forces desperately needed all our support. On the morning of October 25th, enemy flying boats surveyed the Nagumo force, which, despite strong fighter patrols, could do little to keep the long-range planes from making detailed observations of our fleet's strength and manoeuvres. Apparently, a major enemy effort could be expected. Vice Admiral Kondo turned his ships to the south and by late October 25th prepared his planes for airstrikes against enemy forces on Guadalcanal. 100 nautical miles to the east of Kondo, Nagumo's force also worked its way southward as a buffer against the anticipated enemy carrier attacks. Nagumo had learned a bitter lesson at Midway, and he used the tactics which that defeat revealed to him. Sixty to eighty nautical miles ahead of his flagship, Shokaku, steamed the battleships Hiei and Kirishima, the heavy cruiser Chikuma and seven destroyers. The heavy cruiser Tone and the destroyer Teruzuki cut the Pacific waters 200 nautical miles east of the Shokaku to protect his flank. Approximately at 0050 hours on October 26, a large aircraft, presumably a flying boat, appeared over the carriers of the Nagumo force and dropped a salvo of bombs which exploded alongside the Zuikaku, the fleet's second largest carrier. The bombs missed the vessel so narrowly that the entire bridge became enveloped in the smoke of the detonation. Fortunately, there were no casualties. Captain Toshitane Takata, senior staff officer of the Nagumo force, then on the Shokaku's bridge, reported the attack to Admiral Nagumo and Chief of Staff Rear Admiral Ryunosuke Kusaka. Nagumo felt he was being drawn into a trap and dispatched to the fleet the following orders. Emergency turn together, 180 degrees to starboard. This was followed by all ships execute turn speed 24 knots. The assembled ships of the Nagumo force, shrouded in the darkness of the early morning, executed the sudden reversal, of course. Where the fleet had attempted to approach the enemy under cover of night and attack in full strength under the shroud of darkness, it was now in a hasty retreat to the north. The turn was ordered approximately 250 nautical miles northeast of the Guadalcanal airfield. In the early morning of October 26th, I was the staff officer on duty at the Unio's bridge and was the first officer to learn of the bombing and Nagumo's sudden withdrawal. I transmitted the information at once to Rear Admiral Kakuda and the Chief of Staff Captain Mineo Yamaoka. Shortly afterward, Admiral Kondo's flagship, the heavy cruiser Atago, dispatched new fleet orders. The entire Kondo force turned and headed northward at high speed, following the action of the Nagumo force. It was exactly 0200 hours when the ships turned. For the last ten days, we had been without any information as to the movements of the enemy aircraft carriers. We had little knowledge of any American fleet movements, beyond a single report that two battleships and four cruisers had been sighted approximately 300 nautical miles south of Guadalcanal. The attack earlier during the night, however, indicated strongly that American carriers were within striking range of their planes. Admiral Nagumo launched 16 reconnaissance seaplanes and eight Type 97 Kate bombers from the advance and main fleet units to search to the east and south of our ships. The planes took off before dawn. As Takata had forecast, enemy carriers were found in the immediate area. A Shokaku reconnaissance plane searching southeast of the carrier reported at 0450 hours. 
have sighted one enemy aircraft carrier and 15 other vessels. Enemy fleet is bearing to the northwest. The long-sought carrier, or carriers, was 250 nautical miles southeast of the Shokaku, or 140 nautical miles 15 degrees from New Denny Island. The other reconnaissance planes in the area flew to the reported area and continued to track the progress of the enemy ships. The three carriers of the 1st Carrier Division had been in readiness for the fighting. The planes were hastily fuelled and rushed to the decks for takeoff locations. Admiral Nagumo ordered immediate airstrikes. At 5.15am, the first attack force left the Shokaku. Forty-five minutes later, the second group thundered off the ship. Nagumo ordered the latter formations launched ahead of their scheduled departure. Even as the first unit prepared for takeoff, the Shokaku's radar picked up what appeared to be enemy planes approaching our force. Since the Zukaku lacked radar, the great carrier depended upon the radar reports from the Shokaku. Aboard the former carrier, the armourers worked feverishly to load torpedoes. The first attack group, under Lieutenant Commander Mamoru Seki of the Shokaku, consisted of 22 Val dive bombers. Lieutenant Jichiro Imajuku took off from the Zuikaku with 18 Kate torpedo bombers. Protecting the slow and vulnerable torpedo planes were 27 Zero fighters led by Lieutenant Commander Hideki Shingo of the Shokaku. The second attack group was made up of 12 Kates under Lieutenant Commander Shigeharu Murata of the Shokaku and 20 Vals under Lieutenant Sadamu Takahashi of the Zuikaku. The same ship provided a fighter escort of 16 Zeros led by Lieutenant Kenjiro Notomi. The relative numerical weakness of the attacking groups was due directly to the losses sustained in the air battles in the Solomons area. The fleet had not yet received its replacements. Approximately at 5am, even as the first attack group prepared for takeoff, two enemy reconnaissance planes appeared suddenly from low clouds and dropped several small bombs on the Zuiho of the 1st Carrier Division. Captain Suio Obayashi reported that a single bomb struck the rear of the flight deck, tearing a hole in the deck and curling the plates. He could not land any planes, but was able to launch his aircraft. Forty minutes after the first group was airborne, enemy planes attacked the 1st Carrier Division. The bombers appeared suddenly over the Shokaku after emerging from scattered clouds and went into glide bombing attacks. The enemy formations appeared to consist of 15 to 16 planes. Five or six medium-sized bombs scored direct hits on the carrier. The explosions tore great holes in the carrier deck and touched off fierce fires below decks. Excellent and rapid work by the crew extinguished the flames. Fortunately, the attack came after the Shokaku had launched her planes. Damage was confined to relatively small areas, but the ship could not launch or receive planes, and her communications were literally paralysed. A single enemy plane attacked the Zuikaku, but a patrolling Zero fighter destroyed the bomber before it neared the ship. Far to the east of the Shokaku, the Zuikaku sought cover beneath scattered clouds and escaped further attacks. With his flagship crippled, Nagumo ordered Kakuda to take command of the Zuikaku and to continue the battle. The Shokaku left for northern waters and repairs. Prior to the raid on the 1st Carrier Division, Rear Admiral Hiroki Abe's advance force came under enemy attack. The force reported that an estimated 40 dive bombers and 10 torpedo bombers were attacking the battleships Hiei and Kirishima, and the heavy cruisers Toni, Chikuma and Suzuya. Ten dive bombers concentrated on the Tone, 30 dive bombers swarmed over the Chikuma, and the Suzuya received the assault of the 10 torpedo planes. The warships put up a withering anti-aircraft barrage and by excellent evasive manoeuvres avoided what might have been a disastrous blow. The ships received some damage, which was regarded as minor. Only the Chikuma, which bore the brunt of the attack, sustained heavy casualties to its officers and men, including Captain Kaizo Komura. The bombers scored two direct hits on the bridge and a direct hit in the torpedo tubes, but the cruiser was able to continue action. On their way to raid the enemy carrier, Lieutenant Commander Seki's first attack group from the 1st Carrier Division passed a force of about 20 enemy dive bombers headed for the Shokaku. Our escort fighter commander failed to recognise the planes as enemy aircraft and took no action. 
Ten minutes later, Seki's force encountered eight enemy dive bombers protected by six fighters. The escort fighters from the Zuiho, led by Lieutenant Hidaka, ripped into the enemy formations and scattered the planes with heavy losses to the Americans. The wild scramble drained the fighters' fuel and ammunition, and the planes turned back, leaving Seki's force virtually unprotected. The interception enabled the Zuiho to escape bombing, but Seki's planes began their attack with only a few Zeros flying escorts. At 6.55am, the bombers arrived over the enemy fleet. On the bridge of the Hunyo, I heard the radio conversations of our pilots. First, enemy aircraft carrier in sight. Then, a report that the American carrier was still some 250 nautical miles distant from the Shokaku. Shortly afterward, enemy's course is 300 degrees, speed 24 knots. A short wait and all planes go in. At 7.10am, Imajuku's torpedo bombers began their low-level assaults. The group sent back frequent radio reports with the important message that one Saratoga-class carrier is on fire. Subsequent investigation revealed that the enemy fleet was made up of one heavy cruiser, one light cruiser, four destroyers, and the carrier Hornet, the latter surrounded by the lighter ships. Our pilots reported they hit the Hornet with five 550-pound bombs and two torpedoes, which crippled the great ship. I had special interest in this attack. Although I was delighted at the greatest success scored by our carrier planes since the midway defeat, Seki was my old and good friend, and Imajuku a former student. I feared for the lives of both men. My apprehensions were well founded, for their radio reports of their attacks were the last words they ever spoke. Their planes went down before the Hornet's defences. We suffered additional severe losses. Lieutenant Shohei Yamada, the Shokaku's second squadron leader and the hero of many air battles after Pearl Harbor, was shot down. We received the full story from Lieutenant Kazuo Yakushiji, third squadron leader and the senior officer surviving the attack. Lieutenant Commander Seki's plane seemed to have taken several direct hits soon after he gave the order to attack. His craft was directly in front of mine as I went into my dive. I noticed the bomber enter the dive and suddenly begin to roll over on its back. Flames shot out of the bomber and, still inverted, it continued diving toward the enemy ship. Lieutenant Commander Murata of the second attack group of the 1st Carrier Division was another former classmate. He specialised in torpedo attack procedures at the Yokosuka Air Corps and had become one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject. With his extensive background, exceptional flying skill and outstanding leadership, he became the commander of the torpedo units at Pearl Harbor and actually launched the first torpedo of the war. After the opening battle, he served with the Nagumo force. He was wounded at Midway while aboard the Akagi but had recovered and now flew as the Shokaku's group leader and the overall commander of the Nagumo force torpedo planes. Murata was one of Japan's outstanding naval officers. We had the opportunity at Truk to discuss the forthcoming battle in which we were now engaged. I am grateful, Masatake, for all the work you have done with us in the past, he told me at Truk. This time especially we are depending on you, he smiled. The operations command does not always understand the finer points of air attack. Remember the Second Sea Battle of the Solomons. Even those ships on which Mamo, Lieutenant Commander Mamoru Seki, scored direct hits and which were set afire managed to escape. This time I hope the staff will be wise enough to use as many torpedoes as possible. Perhaps then we will be able to avenge our losses at Midway. Murata's second attack group reached the enemy warships at approximately 8.25am and attacked a fleet unit which included one aircraft carrier. Murata encountered the new force about 20 miles southeast of the carrier, which had already been heavily damaged. We received reports from his group that three 55-pound bombs and at least two torpedoes struck a Yorktown-class carrier and that a battleship was hit with two torpedoes and a cruiser with one torpedo. We heard Murata give the familiar All planes go in! command. That was our last contact with him. Lieutenant Sadomu Takahashi of the Zuikaku suddenly discovered an enemy fighter on the tail of his dive bomber. Frantic manoeuvres saved him from being shot down, 
but his plane was so seriously damaged that the rudder jammed and the bomber flew in wide circles. After six hours of frustrating circling flight, Takahashi's fuel was nearly exhausted and he decided to abandon the airplane. By a stroke of luck, he sighted one of our tankers and dropped the plane into the water near the ship, which rescued Takahashi and his crew. Lieutenant Yutaka Ishimaru, another former student of mine, was shot up by enemy fighters as he was returning to his carrier. Seriously wounded, he ditched his plane near a destroyer which picked him up. A few minutes later, he died. The Kakuda force listened anxiously to the battle reports of the 1st Carrier Division. The news of the damaging strikes against the 1st Carrier cheered our men, who were anxious to join the assault. Shortly after 10am, Lieutenant Masao Yamaguchi led 18 dive bombers escorted by 12 fighter planes under Lieutenant Yoshio Shiga from the Junyo. Soon afterward, the second attack group of nine torpedo bombers and five fighters led by Lieutenant Yoshiaki Irikian took off. One of the fighter plane leaders, Lieutenant Shigematsu, was forced to return to the carrier because of mechanical difficulties. There was talk among the other pilots of the unusual mechanical trouble. Shigematsu waited impatiently on deck for engine repair and took off alone to rejoin his planes. A courageous fighter at Midway who survived the loss of the Hiryu, Shigematsu realised the vital role even one experienced pilot could play in a large-scale air battle. A little past the noon hour, the first attack force sighted a burning enemy aircraft carrier and several other warships, but failed to sight the second carrier which had been reported in the area. The attack force leader notified Kakuda that he was going to attack a battleship in the enemy fleet. As his planes formed for the dive bombing attacks, Kakuda received a message from one of his reconnaissance planes which had sighted an undamaged enemy carrier. Kakuda ordered his planes to attack the carrier. Lieutenant Commander Okada, communications staff officer, transmitted the new order to Lieutenant Yamaguchi. The minutes dragged by and finally the radio crackled with the familiar combat commands. We heard Yamaguchi's voice. Enemy aircraft carrier in sight. All planes go in. Aboard the Junyo's bridge, one of the officers grinned and shouted with joy. We now had a chance to destroy two of the largest American carriers. Everything depended upon Yamaguchi's men. Rear Admiral Kakuda smiled at the news of the attack and turned to Okada and me. Our men have become quite proficient. The ship functions as a team. Perhaps we shall compensate for Midway. As Lieutenant Irikian led the torpedo planes of the second attack group to the scene of action, he learned that the formations preceding his planes had attacked the undamaged carrier. Irikian anticipated that the carrier would either be crippled or sinking before he arrived. His expectations were justified, for when he arrived at 1.15pm the ship was aflame. The lieutenant's planes dove in to attack. Three torpedoes blew open the carrier's hull for the final strike against the ship. The battle appeared to be entirely in our favour. Once her planes were launched, the Junyo continued toward the enemy ships under full steam with only three destroyers as escorts. Kakuda ordered this bold manoeuvre because he wished to shorten the distance between the carrier and the planes returning from the attack. Kakuda was an aggressive fighter. The lessened distance between his carrier and the enemy fleet would permit, if it should prove necessary, additional bombings to be made. In the early afternoon, our lookouts sighted in the eastern sky several small planes rapidly approaching the Junyo. The planes skimmed just over the waves, so low that our radar failed to pick them up. We could not identify the aircraft and alerted the ship for air attack. Finally, we identified the first plane as friendly. The pilot rocked the airplane, raising and lowering his wingtips to identify himself. He was a stray who had lost his own carrier. Shortly afterward, the Junyo's planes began to return. Lookouts sighted the planes struggling toward the carrier. Only six Zeros flew formation. The remainder flew in from all directions. We searched the sky with apprehension. There were only a few planes in the air in comparison to the number launched several hours before. We could see only five or six dive bombers. The planes lurched and staggered onto the deck, every single fighter and bomber bullet holed. Some planes were literally flying sieves. As the pilots climbed wearily from their cramped cockpits, they told of unbelievable opposition, 
of skies choked with anti-aircraft shell bursts and tracers. Amidst the confusion of the returning planes, Kakuda turned to me. Air staff, go to the hangar deck and see how many of our remaining planes can be sent out immediately for further attacks. The Admiral had only one thought in mind. He wanted that carrier. Flight officer Yoshio Sakinaga was occupied with the landing planes and could not leave his post. I ran down the three long ladders to the hangar deck where the mechanics attended to the battered airplanes. Of all the planes aboard the Junyo, including the strays from the 1st Carrier Division, only six dive bombers and nine fighter planes were in condition to fly. Kakuda ordered a third attack to be launched as soon as the planes were armed and fuelled. The carrier's captain, Okada, sent the orders throughout the ship. Prepare nine fighters and six dive bombers for attack. Planes will take off immediately after servicing. Lieutenant Commander Sakinaga assembled his pilots for the mission and assigned Lieutenant Shiga, the Junyo's flight group leader, to lead the new flight. Lieutenant Ayao Shirain of the Zuikaku, who had made a forced landing on our ship, also received orders to fly with the group. Shireine was a veteran warrior who had fought in China and who had led the Nagumo Forces fighter planes into Pearl Harbor. He was an outstanding fighter pilot who came from a distinguished Japanese family. Skilled, well-educated and of unusual build, he commanded the respect of his fellow flyers. The eight fighter pilots who would fly again for the third time today were more than pleased to have Shirain with them. The dive bomber unit had lost its leaders. Lieutenants Yamaguchi and Naohiko Miura. The surviving senior pilot was Lieutenant J.G. Shunko Kato, a young officer with an unusually childlike face. Because of his weight, his fellow pilots jokingly called him Tonchan, or Fat Pig. Kato was the youngest reconnaissance officer assigned to the Junyo. His baby face and cheerful disposition made him one of the most popular men aboard the ship. When the third attack was ordered, however, Kato was anything but cheerful. Today was his first experience in battle against an enemy carrier force, and Kato had literally gone through hell. Enemy fighter plane attacks and the incredible anti-aircraft defences had taken a heavy toll on Kato's friends. His own plane had been hit many times, and he had narrowly escaped death on several occasions on his first missions. When he reported the details of the dive bomber attack to Captain Tametsugu Okada, Kato was so shaken that at times he could not speak coherently. Young and lacking experience in circumstances where his friends died all around him, he had suffered a nasty shock. Less than a half hour after he completed his report, the Admiral issued the new attack orders. I found Kato in the aircrew waiting room on the flight deck and told him he was to fly again. To our astonishment, Kato rose from his seat and asked, Again? Am I to fly again today? He could not believe, after the terrible losses we had suffered, that he would be ordered to return to the carnage he had gratefully left. It was difficult for me to explain to someone like Kato why he had to fly again. I remained on the ship. Lieutenant Shiga jumped to his feet and shouted across the room, Tonchan, this is war! There can be no rest in our fight against the enemy. We cannot afford to give them a chance when their ships are crippled. Otherwise, we will face those same ships again. We have no choice. We go. A veteran of China, Shiga fought at Pearl Harbor and in the Aleutians, and since that time had served with me in the Kakuda force. Ever since the Aleutians attack, he had been the Junyo's fighter unit leader. Even now he was preparing to take off with the few remaining planes. Kato stood silently and then stated simply, I will go. He was not a coward. He had been unnerved by his shattering introduction to actual combat, and, in a weak moment, he needed the harsh but sincere assistance of his senior officer. I silently thanked the fates which allowed me, on this ship at least, the company of experienced and capable officers. We had avoided what could have been a serious blow to the morale of the ship. Cato would be all right. Before takeoff, the young pilot addressed his dive bomber crews. We are about to leave for our third attack mission of the day. Our mission is to destroy the enemy's aircraft carriers. Follow me when I attack. Take your planes as low as possible to assure hits. That is all. Man your planes. All through the preparations for the third attack, 
Admiral Kakuda did not utter a single word. His subordinates carried out their tasks quickly and efficiently. The Junyo was a good ship. Kakuda ordered full steam ahead in the direction of the enemy. That was his only message to his men. So long as the ship continued on this course, every airplane capable of taking off from the deck would be launched to attack the enemy forces. If it were necessary, Kakuda would not hesitate to sail his ship directly into the enemy fleet and ram the largest enemy carrier he could find. Kakuda was a hard but courageous taskmaster. The third attack force took off to deliver the coup de grace. By late afternoon, several hours had gone by without any attacks against the Nagumo force. We estimated that by this time the Zuikaku's third attack force should have completed its missions, and, were this true, Kato's small force would be the only air attack strength remaining of both the American and Japanese battle fleets. It was a ludicrous situation, for Kato controlled greater power than any of the dreadnoughts, cruisers and other warships on the vast ocean surface below him. I regretted that I could not be in his place. I would have given anything to be flying that lead dive bomber. But I never flew at the controls of a plane again after my last crash. I was no longer strong enough to handle the plane. I could not help but feel uncomfortable, for I remained on the ship while Kato and his men followed my orders. Every man on the Junyo had his heart with Kato. Everyone waited, anxious and quiet, for the first reports to come in. The first metallic words over the radio startled us. Enemy aircraft carrier is now in sight. Then silence, and the familiar cheering words, All planes go in. How many times this day had we heard the last command before combat? Now only six dive bombers of the former great air fleet were left to execute the order. On the bridge of the Yunyo we sweated out the next reports. The minutes dragged by. Officers and crewmen paced back and forth silently. I stayed close to the speaking tube which led to the radio room, waiting for the first news. Suddenly the tube roared into life. Succeeded in bombing! The attack is successful! The commander called to the communications room. Is Kato still flying? Then silence, and the cheerful single word to us as he put down the phone. Good! An hour later, we sighted the first returning plane. The sky was darkening quickly, and the blinking red and green lights in the wings of the bomber grew brighter as the plane glided in for its landing. A flushed and triumphant Kato climbed down from his bullet-riddled bomber. The day's operations were completed. Our men had fought continually and had suffered severe losses in their attacks against the enemy carriers. I summarised the day's events in my personal memo book. The efficient radio communications between the carriers and airborne planes allowed the first attack force to locate a new enemy aircraft carrier. In the vicinity of the carrier, broken clouds were thickening at 7,000 feet. Lieutenant Shiga discovered the enemy ship through the clouds, but soon lost sight of the vessel because of the rapidly forming cloud masses. Lieutenant Yamaguchi dove toward the sea in an attempt to find the enemy warship but soon became lost in the swirling banks. Finally, breaking into the clear, he discovered an enemy battleship directly beneath him and released his bombs. He scored several direct hits, and the other pilots in the formation attacked cruisers which were nearby. Consequently, only a part of the original force which finally found the carrier was available to attack the ship. Fighters which later flew over the combat scene reported the carrier in flames. We judged that the second torpedo plane unit had succeeded in breaking through a fierce anti-aircraft defence and intercepting fighter planes to score at least four or five torpedo strikes against the burning warship. The attack was extremely costly, for only two of the planes of our torpedo force returned to their ship. As the third attack failed to arouse enemy fighter opposition, we confirmed our estimated direct hits against the ship. These reports were brought in by the fighter pilots who flew escort high above the dive and torpedo bombers. The battle proved so intense and enemy opposition so severe that the bomber crews were unable to assess the results of their attacks. With the operation completed, the Junyo was still steaming at full speed toward the enemy fleet. We had many reports which claimed that both American carriers had gone to the bottom. However, most of these reports were assumptions and could not be confirmed. 
we must be ready to carry out additional attacks on the following day. All through the night, the weary mechanics and aircrew personnel laboured to prepare their battered airplanes for flight. Admiral Yamamoto was kept fully informed of the battle's progress during his stay at Truk. With the battle clearly in our favour, he ordered the entire fleet to pursue the remaining enemy ships and to take every means of destroying the major combat vessels of the enemy force. This was sweet revenge, for the plight of the enemy fleet fleeing after losing its aircraft carrier strength was exactly what we had experienced, only on a larger scale, at Midway. We could not afford to lose for a moment the advantage we had fought for so desperately. All through the night, as our warships plunged at top speed through the Pacific, we could hear enemy flying boats searching for our fleet. The pursuit became increasingly difficult to maintain. The destroyers escorting the Junyo and the Zuikaku sent out urgent appeals for fuel oil. Their plight was so desperate that they risked enemy attack by sending out direct radio signals. Other vessels began to lag behind, and the fleet's formation began to stretch out. Many of our captains hesitated to race at full speed toward an enemy fleet, which we suspected might harbour yet another aircraft carrier. They did not want to expose their vessels to heavy, unexpected air assault. We had moved recklessly at Midway in almost this same situation, and paid the price for our folly. We could not be sure that a third carrier was not waiting to attack, for our second attack group had encountered enemy fighters after previous planes had poured their bombs and torpedoes into the carriers under attack on the 26th. Because of this overcautious manoeuvring and the reluctance of many commanders, we failed to catch the fleeing enemy warships, although we continued the chase until the morning of the following day. At midnight of the 26th advance, warships were maintaining full speed when they suddenly encountered several enemy destroyers preparing to sink the crippled Hornet. We were under instructions from Combined Fleet Headquarters to capture, if possible, the Hornet, which we knew to be seriously disabled. Our fleet units, however, did not close. At least we confirmed that the Hornet's demise was but a matter of a few minutes. From the Junyo's bridge I saw a red glow lighting the horizon far to the east of our carrier. This I presumed to be the blazing hulk of the sinking American carrier. I wondered at the time how the war might have been changed had our navy been fortunate enough to have more combat officers like Rear Admiral Kakuda. The other enemy carrier which had been attacked by our planes was the Enterprise. The badly damaged ship managed to make good its escape from our pursuing fleet and, as we had been warned, we could not afford to allow even a single enemy warship to survive. By the middle of November, the Enterprise had been repaired. The big carrier returned to battle with a vengeance which was stunning. On November 12th, her planes alone delivered the final blow to the battleship He, which had been damaged off Guadalcanal, and sent the dreadnought to the bottom. Two days later, the planes caught and mercilessly bombed the heavy cruiser Kinugasa, which also went down. Also on the 14th, and continuing through the following day, the planes from the Enterprise shattered a valuable transport convoy, attempting to fight its way to Guadalcanal with supplies and reinforcements for our beleaguered troops. The Enterprise clearly played the dominant role in halting decisively our army's third all-out offensive on Guadalcanal. On the morning of October 27th, Kakuda brought the Junyo into fleet formation with the Zuikaku. The all-night repair work of the two carriers gave Kakuda a combined striking force of 44 fighters, 18 dive bombers and 22 torpedo planes. The reconnaissance planes which had been launched from the two carriers before dawn failed, however, to discover any enemy ships or planes. The fuel situation had become desperate, with the escorting destroyers ready to fall out of formation. The fleet then received an order from Vice Admiral Nagumo to assemble and return to base. Nagumo had left the scene of action when the Shokaku received crippling damage and had ordered Kakuda to command the subsequent air battles. Once he discovered, however, that he could not direct the overall operation from the disabled carrier, Nagumo ordered the big ship to return for repairs to truck. He transferred to a large destroyer which became his flagship for the general operation. Since our reconnaissance planes could not locate the enemy fleet by the morning of the 27th, Nagumo ordered his scattered vessels to reassemble. Shortly after noon of the same day, the warships regrouped their formations and refuelled at sea. 
Nagumo once again transferred his flag, this time to the Zuikaku. The carrier's commander, Captain Tamateru Nomoto, had run his vessel and commanded the air battles for three consecutive days, without sleep, remaining at all times on the bridge of his ship. Nagumo personally offered his thanks to Nomoto for the latter's superhuman efforts. This was the first time in the Navy that a warship commander personally directed the actions of carrier-based planes without his staff, no small feat in itself. Vice Admiral Nagumo ordered a special conference held aboard the Zuikaku as the ship returned to truck to discuss in detail the sea and air battle of the 26th. I attended the conference as the Kakuda's forces representative. When boarded the Zuikaku, I went directly to pay my respects to Nagumo. He was on the bridge, his face wan and drawn, and in deep thought it was hard to ascertain the Admiral's thoughts, but obviously he had thrown off the apathetic feeling which had weighed upon him after the midway defeat. Pleased that we had discharged Admiral Yamamoto's trust, Chief of Staff Kusaka warmly praised the accomplishments of the Kakuda force. Kasuka was in a genial mood, and indeed the entire staff attending the conference rejoiced in the newly won victory. For me, the price we had paid was bitter. Lieutenant Commanders Seki and Murata, old and good friends, were gone forever. Even as the conference compared notes, we did not know accurately the losses our own ships and planes had sustained. Some of our men had landed on other carriers, several reconnaissance planes had set down on our Solomon's bases, and the crews of a number of planes which had ditched had been picked up by surface vessels. The data submitted to the conference enabled us to arrive at these tentative conclusions. We based the estimates for the enemy carrier losses on the confirmation of the Hornet's sinking and, the following morning, on the fact that our reconnaissance planes could not find any enemy carriers. The planes, however, did sight a large slick in the immediate vicinity, where an enemy carrier had been reported as fiercely burning. We were forced to rely upon such information because we had lost two of our three dive bomber leaders, all three leaders of the torpedo planes, and many other important officers. Up to the time of this battle, both the Americans and the Japanese had lagged badly in shipboard defences against aerial attacks. Commencing with this conflict, however, anti-aircraft defence rapidly improved in quality and quantity. This sudden increase in the defence available to the enemy ships was felt to account for the exorbitant losses sustained by our planes. Because we had lost so many of our experienced men, the conference had no choice but to accept the reports of young officers who were prone to allow the excitement of battle to colour their observations. We could not follow any other course but to base our future plans on what these young officers reported to us. Much later we discovered that our estimates were far from accurate. The Hornet eventually went to the bottom, sunk by the destroyers Mustin, Anderson and our four destroyers. The destroyer Porter also was sunk. These two ships, however, were the only vessels which did go down. The second carrier to be attacked, there were only two, not three carriers, was the Enterprise. Contrary to our pilot reports, the ship did not receive any torpedo hits, and its damage was confined to three direct bomb hits which, fortunately, inflicted serious damage to the vessel. The reports of the torpedo hits are understandable. Superb manoeuvring by the Enterprise's captain permitted him to escape our torpedoes, which slipped within a hair's breadth of the ship. Our planes also damaged the battleship South Dakota, which bristled with new defensive armament, and the destroyers Smith and the San Juan. We lost approximately 140 men in combat, most of them irreplaceable veterans. American personnel losses of air crews amounted to about 100 men. Despite the gross over-evaluations, we had inflicted telling blows upon the American warships. The sea battle henceforth was officially titled the Sea Battle in the South Pacific, and Imperial General Headquarters made much of the victory. Since the outbreak of the war, the United States had made constant anti-Japanese propaganda radio broadcasts. When I was aboard the Ryujo off the Aleutians, I heard William Winter's broadcast, which ridiculed the Nagumo force as Ahodori, or the foolish bird. Winter crowded long and loud, presumably with justification, since Nagumo's ships had been overwhelmingly defeated at Midway. This morning, at exactly 6am on October 26th, 
I laughed aloud at Winter's words when he admitted that never in its history had the American Navy had so little cause to celebrate its Navy Day. The battle was over, and although we had suffered grievously in losing many of our best pilots, the enemy fleet had been soundly defeated. The victory was to be short. This was our only decisive conquest since Midway, and it was to be the last. By mid-1943 we could no longer ignore the visible deterioration of the Pacific War situation. We still maintained powerful army forces, and our navy posed a dangerous threat with its surface fleet. Despite this land-sea power, however, enemy attacks rapidly depleted our available planes, and it was obvious to all that without mastery of the air Japan could no longer hope successfully to conclude the war. Our loss of air control centred directly about the situation with reference to the Zero fighter. Early in the war, and, in fact, until the later stages of the Guadalcanal battle, the Zero clearly demonstrated its superior performance over enemy fighter planes. The Americans, however, bent every effort to augment and replace their inferior fighters with new planes of outstanding performance, and soon the Zero met increasing numbers of remarkably fast and powerful enemy fighters. In the interim, we were forced to retain the Zero as our frontline fighter. The Navy did not have a suitable successor to the Zero, nor did the Army have an airplane which could favourably contest the American planes. As the war continued, the dwindling number of Zeros were forced to fight under the most difficult circumstances against such planes as the Army Air Force's P-38, which was faster, could outclimb and outside the Zero, and featured high-altitude performance, all coupled with heavy firepower, self-sealing fuel tanks and armour plating. Soon there appeared the Navy's F-4U fighter, the first enemy single-engined airplane clearly to outperform the Zero, notably in maximum speed and in diving speed. The second direct cause of our loss of air control was the numerical superiority of the American fighters in the South Pacific, then the main war theatre. The rapid diminution of our air strength is evident in a running summary of the Pacific War in the year following Admiral Yamamoto's death, when Admiral Minaichi Koga became commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. Koga's first planned large operation was stopped in its tracks. In May of 1943, an American force invaded Atu Island in the Aleutians chain. If successful, the invasion would cut the defence chain we had established across the Pacific. Koga planned a massive aerial counterattack to drive the enemy back to the mid-Aleutians, and for this campaign concentrated the major strength of the fleet in Tokyo Bay. The enemy's rapid moves, however, caught Admiral Koga off balance, and, before he could make his bid for the counterattack, the Americans controlled Atu. One month later, the Americans began a powerful assault against Rabul, rolling northward through the Solomon Islands from Guadalcanal. By November, the enemy secured his forces on the southern half of Bougainville Island, threatening our positions in the entire area. Another massive enemy thrust crushed our defences in the Gilbert Islands, and this too became an American bastion. Seemingly in coordination with this move, the American and Australian forces in the New Guinea area intensified their air, ground and sea attacks. The furious tempo of air and ground fighting visibly reduced our available fighting forces and weapons. By late 1943, the enemy assaulted our positions on the Mercus Peninsula in the western end of New Britain, the very island on which lay our Rabul airfield. We could now appreciate at first hand the incredible power of the American military machine, for despite furious and courageous defensive fighting and counter-attacks, the enemy ground his way northward. By the close of 1943, we were in a precarious position. Our zeros no longer showed themselves over enemy territory, for every venture against enemy positions met awaiting swarms of high-performance American fighters. Indeed, our pilots were hard-pressed even to maintain air control directly over Rabul. Both quantity and quality played a direct part in this constant reduction in our air strength, for the American Navy now threw into combat its deadly Grumman F-6F Hellcat fighter plane. Appearing for the first time in November of 1943, the Hellcats increased rapidly in number. Not only were they superior to the Zero, but our pilots faced literally hordes of the new enemy planes. In late January of 1944, the enemy took the Marshall Islands, 
and, several weeks later, stormed ashore on the Green Islands, some 130 nautical miles east-southeast of Rabaul. Even as the troops hurled our own forces back into the jungles and mountains of these islands, the American engineers performed miracles of airbase construction and again established new fields from which to increase air attacks. <laughs>